Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Artificial Intelligence, How AI is Going to Disrupt Seafood Processing, brought to you by Seafood Source and sponsored by This Fish. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we get started. If you have any technical questions or issues using the WebEx platform, please use the chat box and I will respond right away. If you have any issues with audio, please click on the phone icon above the chat window to receive the teleconference info. For those that do call in, to ensure call quality, everyone's lines have been muted. If you happen to get disconnected, you can log on again using the instructions provided in your webinar confirmation email. If you continue to experience difficulty, please email webinars at seafoodsource.com and we will respond as soon as we can. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box and hit send to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we will have our presenters answer these questions. This webinar will be recorded and you will receive a thank you email with the on-demand materials within two business days. And with that out of the way, I would like to hand things off to our speaker for today, Eric Anotam, CEO of This Fish, Inc. Great, thank you very much. Just gonna share my screen here. There we are. How's that? Looks great, Eric. Okay, great. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar. I believe it's the first uh, webinar that Seafood Source has hosted uh, focused on artificial intelligence. And uh, today we're going to be talking uh, about how AI is going to disrupt uh, the seafood processing sector. Um, before we get into the presentation, I'll just give you a brief introduction to us as a company. So uh, we're This Fish Inc. Uh, we're a software and AI company based uh, in Vancouver, Canada, with uh, staff in uh, South America and, uh, and Southeast Asia. So as a company, our mission is really to drive profitability and sustainability in the seafood industry through better, better data, digital, real-time, and accurate. Uh, and we do this by, uh, by developing both software and artificial intelligence. Uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about our company, uh, please visit our website at www.this.fish. So for today's webinar, I've really laid out three uh, learning objectives. Uh, first, I just wanna lay some foundation around the basics of how AI and machine learning works. Uh, it's new to the seafood industry, so I wanted to kind of just run through a bit of a AI 101. Uh, next, I want to give you a bit of an overview and understanding of how AI is currently being used in the seafood industry. And I want to talk specifically about some R&D projects that we're uh, carrying out uh, at this fish. And finally, I really want to empower you to advance uh, digital transformation uh, in the seafood industry and in your, your own businesses. So I'll talk a little bit about what some of the steps uh, you can take uh, to begin this journey on digital transformation and, and AI. So on the uh, first uh, uh, basics of uh, AI and machine learning, uh, we know that uh, AI is really uh, everywhere in our lives now, uh, in our daily lives. Uh, it's in our social media, it's in Google Maps. Uh, if we do any kind of online shopping or see ads uh, online, it's all AI powered. Uh, our cars may have AI in them. Uh, people have connected devices at home like uh, Alexa. It's all AI driven. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of computer vision now uh, in our cameras, in facial recognition. And of course, much of the supply chain logistics is now driven by AI. So AI is really around us uh, you know, on, a, on a daily basis in our, in our personal lives and how we interact with the world. Uh, and it's increasingly becoming uh, part of uh, industry as well. Uh, in fact, many would say that we're really uh, in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the first was really powered by steam, the second by electrification, the third uh, in the 1970s by computers and electronics. And now many people say we're in the fourth industrial revolution and it's really being driven by uh, digital data uh, and, uh, and AI. 
And so what does this sort of industry 4.0 look like? Well, it's made up of many, many technologies. But I would say that underlying uh, all of this is really uh, AI. And many of these technologies like big data, Internet of Things, cloud computing, many of these are actually the infrastructure that make AI possible. Uh, and then in other cases, like autonomous robots and 3D printing, these technologies just wouldn't exist uh, without AI. So the, the fourth industrial revolution is really uh, about AI. And so why, why are we seeing so much AI, AI around us in our, in our daily lives? Well, there's kind of three meta trends that are really kind of causing this. And the first is really just the sheer volume of digital data in our lives. Uh, since 2010, in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, the amount of digital data in the world has gone up by 30-fold, uh, and it's going to increase even more. And as you'll hear in this presentation, data is the new oil. Data is what fuels AI. If you don't have data, then you don't have uh, fuel to power AI. The second thing is AI is just getting a lot better, uh, exponentially better, in fact. Uh, this graph uh, uh, is basically shows you the performance of AI in a, uh, a large-scale visual recognition challenge that's been going on for the last, uh, the last decade called ImageNet. And as you can see in, from the graph, in 2015, uh, machines started to beat humans at uh, image recognition. Uh, so this just shows you how exponentially uh, uh, better the technology has become, and that's really across the board in any, many types of, of AI. But the one thing that really is dr driving uh, the uh, adoption of technology uh, throughout our daily lives is really about money, and it's about cost. Uh, this is what I kind of jokingly refer to as the fish and chips index. You can see uh, since 1990, uh, the cost or the price of semiconductors or computer chips have gone down by about 50%. At the same time, the actual power of those computer chips have gone up exponentially. So all around us, technology is getting cheaper and we're seeing more and more technology throughout our daily lives. Uh, on the other hand, um, we also are seeing uh, that the value of fish has risen since 1990. The FAO fish price index has gone up by about 60%. So I think these two mega trends are really what's going to drive the adoption of, uh, of AI and digital technologies in the, in the seafood industry. So let's, let's get a little bit into some of, the, some of the definitions and words you hear kicked around like AI and machine learning and deep learning. So I'll, I'll go through <clears throat> exactly uh, what these components are. So AI is really kind of a subset of the broad field known as data science. And it really represents, uh, or it's about how to simulate uh, intelligence in machines. And the aim is really to build machines which are capable of thinking like humans and learning and becoming smarter. Machine learning is really just a subset uh, of, of AI. And uh, it's really about uh, developing machines that make decisions without being programmed, and that is the machines can start to, uh, to learn through uh, more data and uh, grow smarter with the amount of data that uh, they receive. And then in terms of deep learning, uh, deep learning is really kind of a subset of machine learning, and it's really about using artificial neural networks uh, uh, to solve kind of complex problems. The aim is really to build a neural network that discovers hidden patterns uh, in data that maybe machine learning can't. So it's a little bit more of a, an advancement, uh, advanced kind of machine learning. So I wanted to give you kind of a simple example of the power of AI and why, uh, why machine learning and AI uh, is better than the human brain. So I have two examples here uh, with some uh, variables and some outputs. So in example A, we have two variables, X and Y, and we have an output, uh, a number. And so it's probably pretty easy for most of us to predict uh, what that fourth number uh, should be in the, in the column, uh, it's 52. However, if you go over to the second example, example B, you can see we have four variables, X1 to X4, and it's gonna be very difficult for us to predict 
uh, what the, uh, the fourth outcome will be. And that is what machine learning can do. It can basically tease out what the algorithms uh, are for making predictions around what, the, what unknown data may be. And so you can see in the first model, the algorithm is pr pretty simple. There's a, a coefficient of 10 that you multiply uh, the Y variable against. Uh, and in, in uh, the, the program or sorry, example B, you can see there's actually three coefficients. You have to multiply the first variable by 0.15. You have to square the third variable and then times the fourth variable by, by uh, 0.5. So it's a much more complex uh, algorithm. And computer vision uh, works in a very similar way in that um, what happens is uh, a computer basically takes every one of those pixels and then associates a number with it. Uh, so you can basically uh, develop uh, numeric patterns that will reflect the actual visual pattern. And once, of course, we've turned uh, uh, visual representations into numbers, you can develop algorithms and programs to analyze and pre uh, predict uh, what that image is, is representing. And you'll hear a lot about algorithms in machine learning and AI. Uh, they're also known as, as models. And an algorithm basically is a, a mathematical formula or a set of rules for performing a task. So in AI, the algorithms really tell the machines how to go about finding solutions to a particular problem. And there are many types of models or algorithms in, uh, in data science and machine learning. And ma many of them are public and they have names like random force or SVM, like support vector machine or K nearest neighbors. So these are algorithms that are basically used. They're, they're, they're kind of open source, they're in the public and they're often used in data science uh, for uh, for prediction. So how does machine learning work? Well, uh, in this diagram here, you can see uh, at the very top what is kind of traditional modeling or traditional computer programming, where you basically have some data. You have a software engineer that may program a, an algorithm or model, and then that data and model are put into a computer and you output a result. So it's often a kind of uh, a very rules-based programming, like if this, then that sort of kind of programming. But with machine learning, uh, <clears throat> the big differentiator is the learning part or the, the training of the model or algorithm. So what you first do is you start out with some data and you take only a small sample of the data, let's say about 20%, and you know what the expected output of that data is. So you take the expected outputs and the sample data, you put it into a computer and you actually train the model on how the sample data uh, and the expected results are connected, how they're correlated and the pattern. And then once you've trained this model, what you do is you take that model uh, and you take the remaining data, put it into a uh, computer, and then you output uh, some results. And uh, the results are typically a prediction, and you can see how well your machine learning has uh, model has predicted. And the uh, the scoring that's oft, often used is called R squared or R R to the sec, uh, to the square, and it's really it's uh, between zero to one, or actually and it can in some cases be negative, and it determines how accurate or uh, your your predictions are. Going into a little bit more detail on how you actually build out a machine learning project, I'll just talk about that. Uh, and there's seven kind of seven steps. The first thing, of course, you need to do is really identify a problem that can be solved by machine learning and, and define your objectives. Once you've done that, you then go out and collect data. And you know, data is the holy grail. As I mentioned, it's really the uh, the oil that fuels machine learning. And so you go out, collect data, often maybe from multiple sources, uh, and then you need to prepare the data because some of the data may have errors in it, there might be missing data. And what you need to do is clean, match, and blend the data uh, into a, a single database. The next thing you need to do is select your algorithm. And generally speaking, data scientists um, sort of know kind of the strengths and weaknesses of the different algorithms. And depending on the problem that they're trying to solve, they may pick and choose uh, at a certain type of algorithm to, to basically uh, to test. Once you've selected your algorithm, you take a small sample of the data and you train your algorithm. 
then you take the remaining amount of data and you basically test your algorithm to see how well uh, it will perform. And this is where there's the R squared uh, variable and you can see how, how good your algorithm is at pred predicting uh, an outcome. And then if you if it predicts very well, then you can obviously deploy your technology. And you know, generally speaking, you're looking at uh, wanting to get a uh, an R2 value of you know above uh, 0.8, but it really depends on the type of uh, the type of problem you're trying to trying to solve, and really how accurately do you need uh, your prediction to be. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't need to be as accurate in, as in other uh, use cases. So there's really kind of three things you need uh, to successfully deploy AI. Uh, as I mentioned, data is really uh, king, and that data needs to be clean. That, that is, it needs to be uh, you know um, cleansed of any errors. Uh, it needs to be comprehensive. So if you have a problem uh, that you know three or four variables are, are impacting that problem, what you need to do is make sure that you have data covering all of those uh, all of those variables. So you need to have comprehensive data, and then it needs to be complete. You don't want to have missing data in, in your model. The second thing you need are really kind of domain and ex experts. I mean, people with expertise uh, in you know, seafood processing and also in data science, because you sort of need somebody that understands the industry and can identify problems and really have teams that will kind of pioneer in the, uh, the innovation. Uh, and you know, I think data science is, or seafood, the uh, seafood processing sector is still new to data science. So you know, there's not a lot of uh, domain experts out there. So finding experts and bringing them into projects can be can be a challenge. Uh, but the easiest part of I would say the the ingredients in terms of getting is really kind of the technology, the models or algorithms. Many of them are open source, and many of them are tried and tested. So you know, in terms of barrier to entry. It's really about uh, first and foremost the data, then having the experts uh, that help to, to design your projects, and then the easiest part is really getting the technology and, and models. So you know I'm very hopeful about the uh, the possibilities for AI in this in the seafood processing sector, and really the reason I'm really hopeful about it is because. There is a lot of natural variability uh, in uh, aquaculture and wild capture fisheries. So that's it's you know often really difficult for uh, seafood processors to predict quality and production outcomes like yields. There's just too many variables uh, to uh, to actually understand how yields are are impacted on a day to day basis. So these kind of these kind of problems are perfect for machine learning and AI. So anytime in any of your business where you have a problem where you you have unexpected results, unpredictable results, uh, that is potentially a problem that could be solved by by AI. Now, going on to our second learning objective, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of AI uh, in the uh, seafood sector. So. We've looked at uh, uh, software applications uh, throughout the supply chain, and we have identified about 220 uh, softwares in all parts of the value chain, from fishing and aquaculture to you know, production, quality control and processing, to e-commerce and distribution. And of those 220, about 30% of them have some sort of machine learning, computer vision or AI uh, embedded in them. And about 6% of them are blockchain. However, uh, the distribution of AI across the sector uh, is, not, is not the same or it's not consistent. And this graph really kind of shows you uh, where AI is being most heavily used. So you can see here uh, in the aquaculture space, we've identified almost, uh, almost 60 software applications and about 25 of them are uh, powered by AI. And I would say there has been an explosion of the use of AI in aquaculture over the last five years or so. Um, following aquaculture is uh, the fishing industry. Uh, I would say that AI has maybe been used a bit longer there. Uh, and then the next uh, place where AI is used quite heavily and is probably the most mature is really uh, in the uh, marketplace and e-commerce. So, you know, software platforms like Amazon, Shopify, Alibaba, you know, they have been using um, 
AI for many, many years. It's a very uh, sort of mature sector in terms of its use of AI. Supply chain traceability, not so much AI there, although I think increasingly you will start to see more AI. Uh, and in the last five years, I would say there's been an explosion in the number of blockchain powered uh, soft softwares for CFU traceability. You know, in the processing sector, as you can see in the graph, there's not so much uh, uh, AI, although I believe that in the manufacturing sector in general, uh, you're gonna start to see a lot more AI over the next five years. So this next um, <clears throat> this next uh, slide shows what's called the uh, the PAC framework, and this was developed by an AI expert out of Los Angeles named uh, Robert May. And PAC stands for Predict, uh, Automate, and Classify. And you can think of these as kind of the basic core functions of what AI can do. So AI can predict things. Uh, it can automate processes, and it can automate the classification or or more accurately classified things. And on the uh, the top row, you can see uh, the types of, uh, of uh, jobs or functions in the supply chain. So I'll give you some examples. So what do we see AI being used for uh, in the fishing industry? And I would say what you're see, what you see mostly there is around classification, such as, for instance, taking GPS data and vessel tracks and classifying the activity of the vessel. Is it illegal fishing? Is it running or is it fishing? Uh, these are classification questions. Uh, and then there's a lot of use of computer vision, especially with electronic monitoring, with video and image collection out at sea. So again, uh, computer vision is often used to classify activity, you know, recognizing species, recognizing whether it was bycatch, or recognizing whether something that comes overboard uh, on, on board a vessel is maybe a, a bird versus a fish. So a lot of this is around classification and it's being used a lot in the wild capture fisheries and mostly around uh, electronic monitoring. In the aquaculture space, I would say that there is a lot of prediction and automation. So predicting sort of growth forecasting, disease outbreaks, uh, biomass estimates and health status. Uh, and also a lot of automation, where uh, which is also used in computer vision to automate the counting of fish and lice, uh, you know, water quality uh, automation, uh, anomaly alerts, uh, these sort of things. You know, in terms of the, the seafood processing sector, I kind of break it down into three kind of core functions around uh, planning, uh, quality control, and production. I won't go through this slide because the next series of slides are going to talk in a lot more detail about some R&D projects that we are uh, currently uh, developing that will give you a lot, a better sense of how AI can be used uh, in the, the seafood processing sector. So the first one, and this is probably our most well-developed project, is we've developed a yield prediction model. And we've been working on this model for uh, a smoked salmon processor here in Canada and also for uh, for a tuna cannery. So uh, yields, of course, are really a calculation uh, to look at how much raw material uh, ends up in your final product. And the yield comes out to a, a certain percentage. And there's a lot of factors that that impact the yields. Uh, with these two uh, projects, uh, with the tuna cannery, we've been actually using three years of production data. So we have an enormous volume of data to build the model. Uh, and in the smoked salmon processor, we only have uh, just less than a, a year of, of data. So you can imagine the tuna cannery actually has a better performing model, has much more accurate predictions because we just have more data and we can train the algorithm uh, a lot better. So in terms of the model, we really look at two types of variables uh, that we feed into our yield prediction model. And one of them is the raw material uh, data. And of course, after fish is, is purchased and it comes to the processing plant, there's not much the, uh, uh, the production crew, quality control crew can do. Those variables are sort of locked in, they're static. You can't change the size or species of a fish once it comes to the factory, of course. So it's the process control variables that are really the dynamic variables. It's the ones that the factory can control. And that could be you know, time uh, and temperature for cooking, smoking, thawing, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, and then these variables, variables are then put into the model and then you can predict what the yield will be. So on this next slide, this is actually, it's just a random sample of about 100 and I think it's about 160 predictions. And what you can see here uh, on the top graph is the, um, the blue lines are the actual yields and the red lines are, predict are predicted uh, yields. So you can see here, the model performed uh, pretty well, but there were a few instances where uh, the model was off and off by uh, even over 10%. And so the question is, why was the model off? Well, one of the reasons is the model just may not be performing. So maybe we need to put more data into the model to get it to improve its predictions. However, there may be other uh, issues. These may, the model might be pointing out errors in production. There may be data collection errors. The workers collected the data incorrectly or there were a lot of uh, production management issues that one lot was accidentally put into another lot and the weights were thrown off. Uh, or there may be outliers around the quality of the, uh, the product or the performance of the crew that day. So what AI can really do is kind of show you when there are outliers uh, in, your, in your production. And in this AI model, for both the salmon and for the tuna, what we discovered is one of the biggest factors uh, that have, impacts the yield is the duration of the raw material and cold storage. Now, I know most of you are thinking, well, that's not news. We all know that the longer something stays in the cold storage, uh, you know, the, the, the worse quality it's going to be and it'll have an impact on yields. Uh, well, what's, well, that's true. What we've been able to do is actually really quantify that and put that into our yield prediction model so that we can take into account how how long it's been in cold storage and what that impact will be on the, the performance of the yields in production. So what is yield prediction good for? Well, I would say first and foremost, it's really about helping out with daily performance management. Uh, if your predicted yields are quite far off from your actual yields, uh, that may suggest that there have been some errors in data collection or production lot mistakes, or there might be some outliers around quality. So, for instance, if the, predict the predicted yield is off by a certain uh, percentage, uh, that may trigger the production department to, uh, you know, begin an investigation of why the yields were, were off. The other one is really around pro uh, procurement, because if we can predict what the yields on raw material will be, that means we could build an app so that uh, when your procurement department is going out to buy fish, they can actually look at the, the, the price that they're gonna buy it for, look at the product they're gonna turn it into, and then we can predict what the yield is so that you can actually predict your raw material costs for your products. So I think that the yield prediction could be quite helpful for, uh, for procurement for, for companies. And then the third one is really about uh, the supply chain traceability and incentivizing data uh, digitization. As you heard, a lot of the supply chain variables like duration and the cold storage can have a big impact on yields. Or for instance, you know, whether tuna was transshipped at sea or whether there's a particular supplier that's supplying the, uh, the raw material. All of these can have a big impact on yield and companies will see that there is value, commercial value in this traceability data. I mean, Historically, I would say most companies see traceability and supply chain data as a cost center. It's a pain in the neck to collect it. Uh, it's a pain in the ass. But I think in the future, what we'll start to see is a lot of value can be derived from these uh, from the supply chain data. So another um, another uh, yield prediction, uh, or excuse me, another uh, model that we're working on our, our R and D project is really around drain weight prediction, and this. Uh, also involves uh, canneries, and uh, when uh, a company cans salmon or cans tuna, when they after they can it, they uh, cut open the lid, and they need to drain the oil and water out, and have a minimum weight uh, in the can uh, uh, for legal purposes. You know, if, if it's 120 grams of of uh, 120 gram can tuna then it has to have a drain weight of 120. But it's very difficult for um, seafood processors to predict the drain weight. 
Uh, and they often, on average, are putting five to seven grams extra of raw material into the can, which costs them a lot of money. So our idea is to build a drain weight model, a prediction model that will help them better predict what the drain weights will be. So maybe instead of having a variance of five to seven grams, it may only be three or four, and that could potentially um, save hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for a tuna cannery or a salmon cannery. And there are a number of variables that we are uh, looking at in terms of building this model, the raw material, of course, uh, the production process, particularly in a tuna cannery, the cooking process, uh, the type of, uh, of product uh, that they are developing, the size of the can, whether it's brine or, or um, spring water or oil that's put into the can, all of these affect the drain weight. So, in terms of the status of this project, we're working with uh, Ecuadorian tuna cannery, and we're just in the process of, of collecting a lot of the uh, a lot of the data. Another one uh, of a research project that we're conducting in Ecuador as well, and it's related to the the tuna sector, is rapid salinity uh, prediction. So, a lot of the uh, skipjack tuna and yellowfin tuna is. Uh, you know, caught at sea and it's uh, brine frozen, uh, leading to varying levels of salt uh, in the tuna and high salt levels are probably one of the biggest issue uh, in the uh, in tuna processing. And so what they do right now is they cut typically a 200 gram piece of meat out of a tuna. Uh, they take it up to a lab, they blend it uh, and then do a salt analysis uh, on that sample. Uh, it's time consuming, uh, particularly if production's running, you, uh, you can often slow down production because the quality control samples uh, aren't, aren't, aren't reporting their data yet. Um, and it's costly, it takes time and you're obviously damaging, damaging the fish. So in this project, what we're looking at doing is using near infrared uh, devices and basically taking the scan of the outside of the tuna uh, and uh, creating a spectral reading of that tuna and then mapping that spectral reading against a number of other var variables like the size and the species to basically come out with a, uh, a salinity prediction on the tuna. So the idea being is that you could just rapidly take an NIR scanner, scan a tuna and know approximately what the, uh, the salinity would be. And that could allow for very rapid testing of you know, raw materials when it's being unloaded at the port uh, and far away from a lab, uh, or could even be used on board a, uh, a fishing vessel. And that actually leads to our second, uh, or a, a, our second sort of salinity uh, R&D project that we're working on that actually is focused on a large scale industrial purse saners. Uh, when they catch tuna at sea, there's a number of variables that impact the salinity of the tuna including uh, you know, how long it's sitting in the net in the ocean. Uh, they typically then will uh, chill the tuna down in refrigerated salt water on, in one of the tanks on board the, the vessel. Uh, and then they will brine freeze it. So it's the time, uh, temperature and salinity of the refrigerated salt water and the brine that has a huge impact on the, uh, uh, on the tuna's salinity. So our idea is that if we can basically digitize all this data around the vessel, uh, the freezing time, uh, temperature and duration, uh, collect data on the fish species that we could actually predict uh, the salinity of the fish out at sea. And the idea here is that we could better enable the chief engineers who are responsible for quality control management on board the vessel to better understand how their decisions are gonna impact, impact the quality of the fish. So for instance, here, you see there's a minus three skipjack. It came in a 10 uh, metric ton fish, uh, fishing set. Uh, the fishing time was 20 minutes. They chilled it for 24 hours and then put it in refrigerated or uh, brine freezing it for 20 hours. So what is the, the outcome? What is gonna be the salt level of that minus three skipjack? Well, we believe that if we can digitize all of this data on board the, the persaners, we can build a yield or a salinity prediction model and basically uh, predict what the salinity salinity will be. So this slide here is all uh, dummy data. None of this is real, so uh, please don't pay attention to it. I just um, put this in there just to show you 
how we've conceptualized uh, this problem and how we think that machine learning could, could solve it. So on this project, we're hoping uh, later this year to start to work with uh, a tuna company to start to digitize a lot of the data uh, from the vessel and, and connect it with the salinity data from the quality control labs. And finally, um, another project that we're working on is really around computer vision. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, computer vision is often uh, related to automatically classifying things. So with this project, what we're looking at uh, doing is basically taking photographs of fish fillets, uh, particularly uh, fish fillets coming from the aquaculture industry, and then using machine learning to classify them by their size, their color, and their, their defects. So we're currently working with a uh, salmon processor here in Vancouver, uh, and we're in the midst of collecting a lot of data on the salmon fillets, a lot of images that is, uh, as well as we're work at, uh, working on some uh, back-end infrastructure uh, for making this, uh, making this work in, in our software. And ideally, the long-term vision for this project is really to take the factory output, so this really incredibly detailed uh, data around the quality of the fish, and link it back to farm practices and farm data. And the idea being is that if we can actually map the farm practices to the factory outputs, we could better predict, for instance, why some farm fish have inoculation bruising uh, or gaping or other quality issues. So the long-term vision for this project is really to work not only with the, um, uh, the fish processors, but also to work with the aquaculture sector to kind of connect the factory and, and farm data uh, together. Great. So this leads us to our final sort of um, learning objective, and it's really about like what you can do to empower yourself uh, to bring AI and, and digital uh, uh, technologies into, into your own business. I would say that, you know, uh, the first thing to look at is really where you are on the uh, digital readiness uh, scale. And I've worked with a lot of companies and I would say generally most seafood companies are really at the first level of uh, digital readiness. Uh, some of them are maybe uh, 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 closer to or getting close to level two. Uh, I haven't really seen any company uh, that I would say that is at an intermediate step. Uh, so. In terms of digital readiness, one of the first things you, sh you should be thinking about is really how to digitize your data. And this uh, uh, chart here kind of shows you the annual amount of data collected by the type of seafood processing. And these are estimates that we've developed based on working with many of our customers. So for instance, a 100 metric ton tuna cannery, uh, if they're digitizing their production, uh, they'll probably be at about four gigabytes a year. If they digitize also their quality control, I would say they more than double that. So they could be in the eight to 10 gigabytes of data per year. Tuna sashimi uh, and uh, tuna loins, about two to four gigabytes. Uh, smoked salmon, cooked crab, probably around the one to two gigabytes. And things like live, live shellfish, where you're not actually transforming the product, there's a lot less uh, quality and production data. So you're looking at maybe about you know, 300 megabytes, so a lot less data. So I just put this slide up here to kind of give you an idea of the size of the data set that you might have at your company, because it potentially is a gold mine. A lot of uh, insights, business intelligence, and AI can be used to derive more uh, value from that, from that data. You know, in terms of your AI strategy, as I said, first step is really digitization uh, and focusing both on the quality and the quantity of data. Uh, those are both important for, for machine learning. Uh, second is really kind of prioritize projects and really try to balance those costs and benefits and focus on some early wins. I think this is particularly important if your company hasn't really re, uh, begun the digital transformation journey yet. Uh, you want some early wins to kind of keep up morale, um, you know, with your team uh, in adopting new technologies. And then the third thing is be agile and take a phased approach. 
Uh, you don't need a big bang. You don't need to do all of this overnight. Uh, and there'll be a lot of learning as you go. Uh, and, you know, you'll be empowering your team with every new project. And that's the sort of approach that we take at this fish is we try to take a very phased approach with our customers in terms of rolling out uh, technologies in their in their company. And I just wanted to leave you with one final quote. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, data is the new oil. Uh, and this is a quote from Andrew Ng. He's a deep learning expert. He was the head of Google Brain. He's a Stanford uh, University professor, uh, co-founder of Coursera, the, uh, the online learning platform. And his quote is, it's not who has the best algorithm that wins, uh, it who, it's who has uh, the most data. So this is really a data game uh, and a, uh, a data play. So that's the uh, that's it for the the, uh, the uh, introduction of the webinar. And I just wanted to point out that uh, we at this fish we have a newsletter called Catch Up, uh, and we just completed a series of articles that come out every month on the ROI of digital transformation. And now we're actually starting a whole series on AI that's starting uh, in September. And we're gonna be focusing every month on, for, for instance, one core aspect of AI in the industry. And the first one will be focused on AI in aquaculture. Then the next one will be AI in commercial fishing. Uh, and we'll also use the newsletter to report on some of our R&D. So as we near completion of some of our projects, we'll be communicating to our stakeholders through our through our newsletter. So if you'd like to sign up, uh, there's a URL. It's uh, this.fish slash catch up. So please sign up to the newsletter. Uh, and it only comes out once a month, so we won't be uh, sp spamming you too often. And second, I'd like to open it up to a Q&A. And I'd also like to uh, introduce you to Aparna Karate Swararampum. Uh, Rumpan. Uh, she's our lead data scientist at this fish. Uh, she comes with a huge amount of experience in software development, uh, machine learning, and data science. And uh, I brought her in to help uh, answer some of the more technical questions that may come in from the audience. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the uh, webinar, Aparna. Thank you. So it looks like we are entering the Q&A portion of today's presentation. As a reminder, please type your questions into the chat box and hit send to submit them. Um, it does look like we've already got quite a few questions here. Um, one of our attendees is asking, it sounds like we are at the beginning of the of digitization of the seafood space. Can you talk about your vision for a fully mature industry using data, AI, analytics in a robust way? What is possible? Um, yeah, so I mean that's a that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big question. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know there is a lot of adoption of AI in, in the aquaculture space. I would say that within the next five years, it'll become fairly mature. Uh, the same is true also around commercial fishing, especially with uh, image recognition. You know, I think it's it's really the seafood processing space where I think you'll see uh, a lot of activity over the next five to 10 years. And, you know, the, the seafood processing space, it's the manufacturing space. They are, uh, I would say, behind in the adoption of AI, but that's also generally true of manufacturing overall. Uh, if you look at the adoption of AI, you know, in business practices, you'll see a lot of it in sales uh, and, and marketing and logistics. Uh, less of it actually uh, in the manufacturing process. So it's true the seafood processing sector is is sort of behind in its adoption compared to like aquaculture and fishing. But I think over the next five to ten years, you'll start to see more, uh, you know, seafood companies uh, digitizing their data and trying to find value uh, value in that in that data. So you know, um, my vision for the future is is one where you have a, a fully connected uh, supply chain. Uh, it's a vision with a lot more IoT or Internet of Things, or smart sensors, uh, and the automated collection of data. So, you know, one thing that we're focusing a lot on as a company is we're a software company, but we recognize a lot of data can be uh, collected by machines and sensors. So we're doing a lot of work at looking at uh, the whole IoT space and new sensors coming on, on board for you know, uh, 
tracking movements or temperature uh, temperature sensors and, and smart sensors and this sort of thing. So I think in the future, what we'll start to see is a lot more automated data collection. I think that increasingly companies will see the value of traceability data and there'll be more demands in the supply chain for digital data coming you know, from the farms, coming from the fishing vessels uh, into the processing sector and then onto, onto the retailers. So it's, it's not gonna be done overnight. Uh, the one thing that I like to point out, uh, and, and I like to say, the seafood manufacturers, the seafood processors, are, there's no doubt in my mind, they are the most important node in the supply chain. There are literally millions of fishing vessels and farms in the world, but there's only about 50,000 seafood processing facilities engaged in global trade. So if we can work on digitizing the seafood processing sector, I think that that will have a very positive spillover effect on the rest of the supply chain. And so as a company, that's one of the reasons why we're focused so much uh, on the seafood processing space. Great, thank you for that, Eric. Um, we have another question here. Uh, one of our attendees asked, in predicting yield, what account is taken of onboard, hand, onboard handling? Um, for example, temperature and time and storage mode, et cetera. Um, so un unfortunately, not much right now. Uh, and as I mentioned, and the reason for that is because a, a lot of this vessel data is not currently being shared uh, with the uh, the uh, the uh, the factories. So maybe I could hand it over to Aparna. She worked on our yield prediction model. Uh, maybe she can talk about like how getting more data maybe could improve the the predictions. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question because this is something that we've been wondering ourselves. Like um, uh, right now, unfortunately. Like Eric said, once uh, the fish is in the factory, all the uh, handling variables are treated as absolutes, like there's nothing we can do about it, right? Um, which is also why, so one, so as we even, um, uh, you know, launched the on vessel project for salinity prediction, that data that we collect there could be extended into yield prediction or drain weight prediction or many such applications, right? And uh, uh, we've seen some evidence of, um, you know, the impact of uh, the, the waters in which the fish is caught. Um, and we have, uh, we, we don't have enough data to prove this, but we do have a hypothesis that transshipment can affect the quality of fish. And uh, we definitely know that the storage time uh, impacts uh, the quality of fish. So, but we have no uh, measure of the time it was uh, stored on vessel yet. Um, so things like that, uh, it we it's all hypothesis. We think it would have an impact, and uh, we hope to collect uh, data and connect that to our current models uh, in the future. Yeah. Thank you for that, Aparna and Eric. Um, another question we have here. Uh, what capabilities for seafood sector workers are needed to be developed in order to use AI, not for designing models, but for applying it? Yeah, so I, I, I think that in terms of um, in terms of the application of it, I think that uh, if AI is, is working well, uh, it'll be, you know, fully integrated into tech to technologies. And you should think of AI as not really kind of replacing workers. But being, I like to call like our own technology, um, sort of like the the R two D two of of seafood processing, and that is the AI, the what we call our tally bots. They're really little digital helpers that can help workers in the factory, um, and they, they could do all sorts of things. For instance, like automated quality control checks. You may have uh, some non MSC uh, certified or non MSC certified uh, raw material, uh, and then you have a sales order that requires MSC product, and uh, you might be scanning in the raw material into your sales order, and you could program uh, you know, an AI to basically check to make sure that their uh, specifications of the raw material meet the sales order or production order. So that would be an example where you know, a warning would come up to a worker, and it would just warn the worker uh, that you know, they are now uh, scanning some non 
uh, certified uh, raw material into a, a sales order with you know MSC specifications. So that's kind of an example of of how AI should really work. It should be easy to use. It, what it really is doing is providing some extra advice uh, and help to uh, to the workers. I think that more at the senior management level. I think that um, you should do some you know get some basic training and uh, you know we ourselves do a webinar kind of like this a kind of ai 101 often with our customers because we want to empower the production and quality control managers to understand how ai works because if they understand how it works and they know what problems they have they can help us match their problems with the technology uh, and then develop like ai projects uh, you know, in their in their production or quality control processes. So, you know, I would say at the worker level, I would say there's not that much training. If AI is working well, it should be really kind of providing some advice uh, or instruction to the workers. Uh, and then at the at the more senior management level, uh, I think that you should probably undergo some basic training in in you know uh, dig data digitization and and AI to kind of help empower your your management team. Great, thank you for that. Um, another attendee is wondering, are there apps which are using multi-company data in some of some of the industries, general, but not specifically for seafood? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question because, and I'll get Aparna to, to uh, chime in here too, because uh, for us right now, we are, some of our projects, for instance, we will train and build a machine learning algorithm specifically for that uh, processing plant, like around yield prediction. Uh, and that might be because how they grade their, their fish uh, and how they process their fish may be different th than another uh, fish plant. So you can't take data from another fish plant and train the model because uh, you know, the processes are different. However, with salinity prediction, uh, you know, we could take, uh, you know, data from multiple uh, tuna factories, if we had, and use all of that data to train the model. So in some cases, uh, the AI will be very specific to, uh, uh, you know, a, a process at one company. And in, in another case, it'll be more more generalized. Um, and Aparna, I don't know if you'd like to, to chime in here on, on this sort of question about, like, how you, and maybe talk a little bit about I know a lot of people are worried that around data privacy uh, and their data going in to train a machine learning model and somehow exposing their proprietary information. I was wondering if you can kind of demystify this for everyone. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, so going back to the question, are there apps that combine data from multiple companies? Uh, you also qualified it by saying not necessarily in the seafood, then the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, pretty much any powerful AI combines data from many, many, many different sources, and that's what makes AI so powerful. Um, when in context of what Eric just asked, like um, say we have uh, multiple tuna processors, and uh, we know for a fact that uh, the more uh, variability in data that we collect across processors, the, the stronger models will become, but then uh, all of them are competitors. Uh, are, does that mean they're giving away their competitive advantage to their competitors? Uh, the answer is no, you're not giving your data to them. What you are, uh, what you would be feeding into is a sort of learning from the data, right? Like none of your competitors are ever going to know exactly the standards or your process table information or any such thing, right? Um, for example, so if you go back to the simpler example that Eric walked you through earlier in the slide, right? Like you had like four variables and the machine learning model kind of figures out that there's a formula here. So a model is, end of the day, just that. It's a formula. And the formula gets more and more precise the more data we add to it, right? And what we do ship is just a formula. And the formula has no memory of the data that it trained with. It, it just has the coefficients and like, you know, are you squaring it? Are you cu cubing it? Now, that's a very simpler explanation of it. But you know what? That, that's basically what happens. So we ship a formula. 
and the and if you do feed into the formula if you if you agree to like um, you know uh, use the formula that was trained by many different data sources that would mean you have access to a very powerful formula for prediction your data is yours but you're using a very powerful formula uh, to predict your on your own data so yeah i hope that cleared it up just a little yeah and there, there's definitely a lot of sensitivity about the so-called sharing of data and and i think that um when we take data from multiple if we were to take data from multiple customers as aparna said what we're just doing is training the model just to be smarter and smarter so all the companies that use that model will now have a better model that will better predict like production or quality outcomes uh, without actually sharing their data uh it's just you're helping to kind of train train the uh the you know the ai model Great, and thank you for that response. Um, another question we have here, how can AI and digital technology also help to address work deficits like forced and child labor, modern slavery, slavery hazards and risk to workers, health and safety, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a very good question. I would say that, I mean, at a, bit, at a fundamental level, the question is around, um, uh, the digitization of supply chain data and getting it, uh, you know, passed from one uh, operator in the supply chain to the other, uh, and then creating some transparency around those those supply chains. Uh, and increasingly, you know, uh, governments are looking at using AI to for anomaly detection. So, you know, uh, no surprise that uh, the U.S. Uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, started to use AI to um, detect uh, uh, whether there was kind of fraudulent or food safety issues in seafood. So it was a pilot project that I think they started uh, two years ago. And basically what they can do is, is look at their history of, inf uh, of infractions, maybe for uh, food safety or other you know, supply chain issues, uh, and then create a model that will better predict whether or not uh, a particular shipment of fish into the United States, for instance, is coming from a higher risk uh, supply chain for social or maybe uh, environmental purposes. And like right now, um, you know, the uh, a lot of a lot of the sampling, I believe, is just random. Uh, but if you could imagine, if you could build a model where you could classify uh, some of the seafood or 10% uh, of the seafood coming in as high risk. That means you don't have to randomly sample 100% uh, of the seafood coming in. You might randomly sample uh, only the 10% uh, and, uh, you know, have a higher probability of, of uh, actually catching product that is doesn't meet some import import requirements. So I think increasingly you are going to see a lot more enforcement agencies using AI. Um, and I like to say that uh, if you have a business model, that relies on uh, being opaque and a lack of transparency, you are living on borrowed time because uh, the world's gonna catch up to you fairly quickly, I would say in the next five years. Great, um, another question we have here. How can small local wild seafood processors strategic strategically adopt and benefit from AI? What would you attempt to adopt first? Yeah, I mean, I I think that's an easy question in a way. I mean, uh, if I were to talk to the the CFO or the the owner of the, a small seafood processor, I'd ask them where their where their costs are, uh, and depending on where they're located, uh, you know, they they could have some high labor costs if they're in you know Canada, the United States, uh, if they're you know in Southeast Asia and 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 Latin America. Uh, it's maybe raw material costs that they're more centered on. And generally speaking, I would say that it's it's really uh, you know yields and and understanding better understanding your your production and having better control over your over your production. And I mean, some simple uh, data uh, digitization, uh, the one of the big benefits of that is it kind of gives you a real-time view of your business, of your inventory, of your production process so that you can better track things like um, 
you know, uh, duration in cold storage. I mean, I know, you know, small processors here uh, that I've, I've talked to that, uh, you know, they do a stock take and they realize that they have 100,000 pounds of product that's uh, out of date uh, in their cold storage because they're managing it on Microsoft Excel and they just kind of lost track of it. So there are some really early wins, but, and I would, I would just look at your business and, and determine where you're, where you're seeing losses in, in badly managed cold storage. Uh, I know another company that found that, that determined that their workers were accidentally overstuffing their shipping containers by, by 10% leading to about a half a million dollar loss a year. Uh, so I would look at, you know, problem areas in your business and try to focus in on those, especially when you go talk to technology vendors, you know, just tell them, Hey, here's the problem that I want to solve, you know, and is your technology a match for my problem? Great. So it looks like, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's program. Um, I do just have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we officially close out. Um, if you could please fill out the short evaluation form that will appear once you close the webinar, this will better help us serve your needs in future webinars. And as a reminder, the on demand materials will be emailed to everyone within 3 business days. These materials will include a PDF of the slides, as well as a link to the recording of today's presentation. Thank you again to Eric and Aparna for a great presentation today. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. This webinar was brought to you by seafood source and sponsored by this fish. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.